Hey guys, I'm up here in northern New South Wales, catching up with a pure legend, free surfer, best free surfer in the world, Dave Rusevich, environmentalist, very special man, and I can't wait to get him on the Upcast. Oh God, there's too many jellyfish. It's such a wonderful ride. It's such a wonderful ride. Hey guys, welcome to another Otcast. We are in northern New South Wales, Australia, and I am lucky enough to have a very special human being right next to me, Dave Rustovich. Thank you, Rusta, for being on the Otcast. Thanks for having me. And Oc. thanks for having us in your world. Oh, yeah, likewise. It's a beautiful spot here. I very love lucky. it. Yeah. I've come to visit you before, and you built a beautiful house, and you're happy, content. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Last time you were here, we had uh, Lauren and I were living in a little cabin. And uh, I remember Hendrix and um, Donovan, Donovan and Petra and everyone were here and little J-Boy and they were running around like crazy because we had <laughs> heaps of food growing and they were you picking did. the raspberries and, and just fizzing on the property and yeah. that was a good memory, that was a good time. It's beautiful. Mm. You, where'd you grow up? Not here, um, further up in Queensland? Yeah, uh, I was in New Zealand till I was seven, yep. uh, then at Burley till I was about like 17 or so and then I was just totally on the road mm -hmm. and uh, and then pretty much moved down the coast to uh, Brunswick Heads area uh, when I was around 20 yep. and then um, now I'm on the south side of the Cape of Byron yep. and um, so this has been the place that I've spent the most time in my life for sure now yep. northern New South Wales is like more my home than anywhere else mm. for sure. It's a beautiful place. Yeah. Um, before we get into surfing and uh, I can't wait to get into that. But before that, you had success as a uh, swimmer, an Olympic <laughs> swimmer. As like a budgie, a, not a Olympic, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. a gold medalist, they say. Yeah, yeah, I pretty much lived in my budgie smugglers. <laughs> you did? At was, what age? Oh, oh, really, since I was seven, yeah. When we seven came, till? Yeah, yeah, I remember my first swimming race was in New Zealand and I didn't breathe once. I remember actually putting my head down and swimming from one end of the pool to the pole. other, just like this, Ooh. just windmilling. Nah, it would have to have been a 25, <laughs> but just doing that. And then, uh, and then when we came over to Australia, getting uh, inducted into the uh, clubby scene was really fun. But then when I, I saw all the surfers just down the beach surfing on the same Sundays doing the board riders club meets when we would be there doing the clubby mm -hmm. thing, I always just wanted to be with the surfers over there. And so were you, were you, you were surfing already at that yeah, stage? I was, yeah, I sort of started surfing. I was body surfing a lot more than okay. surfboard riding. But um, it was just fun, fun thing to do as a kid. Well, when, um, now coming back to professional surfing, at the start of your career, you had one of the most highest, pro highest profiles as a competitive surfer. You were, you know, head to head with Joel Parkinson when, when you were a junior. I was watching many of those um, <laughs> pro junior finals at Burley Heads. Yeah, yeah. Incredible. Uh, you were touted to be, you know, one of the best. I mean, you're obviously one of the best free surfers in the world, but you went the other way. Um, well, it's very kind of you to say such things. No, um, but yeah, you did. You wanted to... That was that time, you know, and, and yeah. Billabong at that time had the most amazing junior program. You know, I remember doing the trips with um, Vinny Lauder and the yeah. crew. Yeah. And uh, I actually was, I was hoping we'd get to talk about this because um, I saw Margot the other day. Oh, you did? I was just down Perfect. the point here and, yeah. and he and his son Michael were having a surf yeah. and, and uh, we just bumped into him and just had a big hug and we're just like, That's man, so cool. we've had such, such amazing times together and he had a huge influence on me as a kid because we did those road trips for all those contests, yeah. you know, between all the junior contests, mm -hmm. we would get in the Tarago and, uh, and just trip, you know, down the coast or up the coast to the next event. And, and so there would be, and I remember you were with us on a few of those, yeah. um, but most of the time, you know, there was like Fergo, Andrew Ferguson, yeah, yes. Virgo, oh, he was all time. and he was uh, such a good goofy footer. Amazing, Aboriginal boy, good yeah, friend, yeah, legend, yeah, legend. Really so there was Ferg and and Louis Egan was with us, and and always Margo, sometimes Munga, yep. and uh, and then there'd be Joel and Dino, mm. uh, and myself, and maybe like Bubba, yep. and uh, a couple other crew, um, and. You know, the biggest thing for me with all of that, that was must have been that so much fun. it was community. Like yeah. the, the thing that I loved the most out of all of that was just being with like your mates and community, you know, and 
and the whole contest thing, excuse me, the whole contest thing was um, more of a side note for me. I was never really that interested. I was, I was only really doing it because it was the only way to get sponsorship. Yeah. Like yeah. really at that time, Margot was, yeah. you know, Margot and Frankie Oberholzer maybe were the only two free surfers on the planet who hadn't um, competed and been a world champion and then gone on to free surf. You know, mm. like it was, they were the only two guys mm. really on the whole planet. So... Frankie, so, oh, Frankie, Frankie from o, South, yeah, South, South Africa, Africa on the search, yeah, you know, yeah. he was doing that mm. with Tommy Curran and that. And, and so it was just a different time in that way. There was no way to be measured against your peers mm. then um, unless you were in the contest. And yeah. so I was just doing that because yeah. it was the only way to really avoid going and getting a job that I didn't want to do <laughs> yeah. down the road or whatever on the Goldie or mm. something. And and uh and so i was just doing the contests you yeah. know and so the, su- the success of those things were not were just things priority. that i was like stoked because it just kept the ball rolling yeah. it meant i could go to hawaii at the end of the year you know yeah. the, the crew would be like okay you did all right with that one event <laughs> uh here's a ticket to go to hawaii yeah. and you can sleep on the floor of that johnny <laughs> theodore's rat pit at the back of sunset there or something yeah. you know yeah and so um, so it was always like that. Yeah. That was just the deal then. And, and I was surfing against people like Joel, you know, and yeah. Mick, who were just yeah. gnarly machines. 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 And just fizzing to catch that one wave yeah. and like just so, so into it, you know. And Joel and I were really good mates then and, and still are, but we just don't see each other these yeah. days. But, but at that time, I just knew I didn't have what those guys had, really? you know. And it's like in skill either, man. They're, they're absolute <laughs> freaks. But... But in the competitive side yeah. of things, yeah. I just didn't have it. Yeah. I just really didn't have it. Yeah, well, um, what about the time? I want to know about that actual day, the time that you went in to tell Billabong that you wanted to be a free surfer and they backed you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, that was, that was interesting because actually that came the year that Joel won um, the, the J-Bay contest. Oh, wow, he did. I don't yeah. know what year that he was. He was super young. But yeah, we were like... 18 or something mm-hmm. at the time, 19, and uh, he was a wild card for J Bay. He, he went on and won it, and then I got the wild card through the through Billabong for the Mundaka yeah, event, and I, I got remember. to the quarters or yeah, something. I got I got fifth, and after that after that quarter final, I came in and was sitting on the rocks just down from the inlet at Mundaka yeah. with um, Joel and and Louis Egan, yeah. and Luke was like, look. You know, you guys, you're gonna to have to get on the QS, and you know, it might take you a couple years. You might do it in one, but you're just gonna to have to work really hard, and you'll be on tour, and you're gonna have a great career if you want that. I remember we were having a couple of beers, and I was probably pretty <laughs> activated because I had a couple yeah. of beers after being in this big hoo ha contest, yeah. and the sun was setting, and it was the Basque country and <laughs> yeah. the whole deal, you know. <laughs> and I was just hearing him, and I was just like, you know what? Fuck that. I Did just you? do not want to do that. Wow. And Joel was like, yeah, all right. Yeah, I reckon I can do this. Yeah. And I remember just, it was like crystal clear. Joel said, I'm doing it. Yeah, he was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and th- th- those guys wouldn't remember it. But for me, it was a, a, a real moment because I was just like, he said, look, in the next couple of years, you're going to have to do that. And I just thought about being, you know, 19 and 20 or and 20 and it. 21 and doing it. And I was just like, I kind of. I just don't see myself there, oh, yeah. and uh, and so I was like, "Yep, I'm not going to do it." And then um, I hit up the crew at Billabong and uh, really sort of sheepishly mm. asked ab- about just going surfing and experimenting with the boards that I was really fascinated with, and going to you know places way off the map and just doing something different. And uh, and they were like, "Okay." Just give it a shot. Let's see how it goes. You know, give it a year. And yep. We'll just see how things go. And uh, it was right at the time when when Margs was slowing down. He, Brendan was like he, having kids, and he was yeah. sort of just cruising a little more. And perhaps in their mind, they saw me as maybe coming into that position as Brendan was slowing down with his travel, um, or whatever it was they were thinking. But um, but we did that, and I just I just said yes to things. Like people just would ring up or write and say hey there's this you know place in wherever in indo or in pacific or in africa or whatever and you know you should come and come surfing with us and i'd just be like sure i just said yes to everything Mm. and at the end of that year the all the crew at billabong were just like hey this is a good thing lots of people are taking an interest in the weird boards you've been riding in these waves that people wouldn't normally ride those sort of boards or 
you know, there's just an interest in what you're up to. And so they just said, keep going. And yeah. that was just the way it went. This is history. Yeah, it was really, um, it just felt like a bit of a natural yeah. sort of mm. fork in the road. What if they said no? <laughs> Funnily <laughs> enough, at that time, I was thinking I would do um, like a, a cocktail barman fucking <laughs> thing, which is ridiculous because I'm not even really interested in alcohol. Um, <laughs> But I was, at that time I was, yeah, you know, right. I was 18 or something. Yeah, yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah. let's do whatever. Mm. And uh, I was thinking I'd just get a shitty job like that that would have me working at night. Yeah, so you can see. And I day. can do it anywhere around the planet. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and preferably in places where there'd be lots of beautiful women <laughs> and music and good surf and all the shit you're interested in when you're 18, 19, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that was really as far as I'd thought about it. Yeah. It wasn't really a great backup plan there <laughs> at all <laughs> that's why i was like really nervous thinking oh should i even be doing this but yeah it, it was just out. yeah it was just a natural yeah. turn it worked out yeah who was shaping your boards back at that time kind of anyone anyone but i was getting okay. um i was really dick getting into boards with dick van stralen yeah, yeah. and uh and chris garrett and weber for a little bit and all kinds of different people um but between contests, I was riding like a 411 stringerless yeah. little thing <laughs> out of a piece of scrap foam from a paddle board. Tiny little board and just feeling things that I'd never felt before and, uh, and riding keel fin fishes and stuff. And it just felt really interesting and playful and uh, meaningful to me in some way. I don't know what it was, but it was just, I just was having a lot more fun. Mm. And uh, uh, I think one of the, also one of the things that sort of wigged me out with contests was like, we would, we'd all go down to the beach together and if I lost, I'd come home and, you know, most of us, if we lose oh, yeah, an event, you come home, you're pretty bummed yeah, and you, yeah. you go home and you're like, you know, you're feeling kind of shit. And I, I kind of would just think about that and go, man, I just had a day at the beach. I shouldn't be bummed. I shouldn't be bummed. Mm. Like, I just had a day at the beach with friends and I was surfing and why the hell am I feeling lousy right now Mm. Uh, and maybe that's just me taking it too seriously with contests or whatever it is taking it personally but but that was also something that really stood out for me where I was just thinking yeah there's just something else here for me to pursue well I was the same I mean there was another big reason why I stopped when I did because I couldn't handle the highs I could handle the highs don't worry about that (laughs) but um yeah I, I you know when you lost you just went into like a depressive state yeah probably led me to going through depression through my life because you know you've just surfed like sometimes perfect waves yeah and you lost and you lost early and you don't like it yeah and surfing probably shouldn't be like that but i mean what else when you're in a professional you know thing there's there's it's the game really. yeah you're not human if you're not bummed really yeah totally i mean you got to care about it yeah how did that go for you then um Oh, like yeah. the comparison, I wanted to ask you yeah. about just the comparison between like in, in your memories now when you think about like the most amazing surfs you've had where there's been, you know, say it's Nihiwatu or something yeah. in Indo or, yeah. or yeah. somewhere where there's no events, there's no yeah. hoo-ha around, mm. maybe there's Jack or someone was pointing a camera at you, yeah. But, yeah. but you're just surfing. How do those moments compare to the competitive highlights you've had in your life like is there something you where you measure them against each yeah, other or well, you know what? how do they I rate mean, those certain times like in Niuatu like surfing you know to take Jack out of the situation because he's filming but I'm, un- I'm the only one out there and you know sometimes where he takes me way up into the desert or something it's spiritual it really is it feels so spiritual but when you go into a contest it takes the spiritual side out of it because you forget about that because yeah. your competitive drive takes over that, mm. and it's hard to connect to that, mm. you know. Um, unless you've won and there's a rainbow and, stuff, <laughs> <laughs> and it starts raining, it's a blessing. <laughs> you've won, you like forget about the contest. Yeah. It's a spiritual now. But other yeah. than that, your competitive drive just takes over, and you forget the spiritual side. And, and it's a big thing to miss because surfing is so much that, right? Wow. Mm. So yeah, so the boards. Um, do you ride what they say like a conventional surfboard anymore? Um, it was funny, actually, Sean O, Sean Doherty was saying the weirdest thing I could do right now would be to rock up somewhere when the surf's pumping with a 6.1 JS or something under my arm. 
<laughs> you turn some heads. <laughs> I think probably people would trip out on that more than anything. Um, but uh, so that's a no. No, that's a, a straight up no. Straight yeah, up no. I can't even remember the last time I rode a thruster. So what are you riding at the moment? Um, you still ride a layers? Not really. Eh? Oh, wow. The whole the whole wood thing um it's of, fucking hard on your body man Is those it? boards are really taxing on oh. the body i pulled i like strained hamstrings oh, tweaked really? my knees out blew ankles out they're they're really, really? hard mm. on the rig so mm -hmm. uh, i uh I don't really pull them out much. Uh, the one place I really want to get to ride one of those is at uh, J Bay uh -huh. one day, so I'm sure that'll happen. Mm. But generally, I don't really use them. Most of the things I'm riding at the moment are in the um, sort of keel fin fish outline. Wow. So that's like, you know, straight, deep swallow tail, straight outline. Um, uh, boards. Keel fin, as in the old Shane Haran keel fin? Or? No, no, keel fins as in the D, they're like a D shaped sort of fin. Oh, um, okay. Same name, but the crew that made them in San Diego in the 70s called them keel fins. So, oh, getcha. Um, so uh, some of those, but they've got a bit of a twist on them these days. Uh, Greeno lives kind of over the hill from us here. Yeah. And so uh, he and I have been just experimenting with some stuff the last couple of years well i have he's been doing this shit for decades now this is a legend george Green. Yeah, yeah yeah so uh he's just sort of um through you know proximity really living just over the hill here from each other and gardening a bit together mm -hmm. and sometimes going out in his boat and stuff um he's just opened up and and likes to throw a bit of a spanner in the works with me <laughs> in, in terms of you know giving things of a different nature a real shot yeah and so he's got these edge boards these boards that have got like a you've got the standard semi-standard rail and then in from the outline of the board is another edge and so you have this edge that runs all the way down the board and uh, that acts as like a center outline of your board which is really straight and then you've got your outside outline of your board which is really curvy so oh. it's kind of two boards in one so oh. when you're going straight you're on the planing hull which is the center part of the board mm -hmm. which is real straight and has these weird edges so and the fast. rails are out of the water wow. but then as soon as you turn the rail goes in the water and you're turning on the outline oh, of the board and it's super complex stuff um and really really fucking hard to ride and you're riding two different much, boards at once. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much like two different boards at once. Um, and I pretty much tweaked my neck out for really? like a year and a half straight from riding these things and going really, really fast. Like I rode one at Cloud Break that completely blew my mind. I went from up near the ledge all the way through the bowl bit there through shish kebabs mm. at the end without mm. turning and this board just it's went flying. faster and faster and faster and faster. Wow. So I had these really single fins with these really bizarre moments of speed on them but then as soon as I'd go to turn, they would just do the craziest shit. <laughs> and, uh, and I would just go over the handlebars and my neck would go and I'd be walking around like this for a few months and then I'd get up the balls to give them another crack and then I'd get on it again at a point break somewhere here and feel something else that was really new. Um, but they're really, really hard to ride. Yeah. So since doing that for a couple of years, I've just sort of adapted some of those things, mainly the edge. Uh, into the modern boards that I'm making with um, a mate of mine, Gary McNeil, where we've, we've still got like a really modern sort of board, modern rocker, modern rails. Uh, we're just putting this edge on the bottom. So that's kind of yeah. where I'm at at the moment, which oh, is cool. just a fun thing. And, and it's just from, you know, really just from having time with George. And, yeah. and, you know, you see these old images of George doing bottom turns on his spoons, where his fin's not even Crazy. in the water and he's just flying around the corner. And it's all because of these edges. Mm. So, so you do shape a little? Oh, I do, but I'm really, really bad. Really? So <laughs> I've, had a, I've had a crack and they're, they're really, really bad. So uh, I've just been playing around with those things with mates who are good at it. Yeah. Really. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm definitely not good enough to do <laughs> something and, that um, technical. You're an amazing big wave rider. And I hear you've been um, experimenting with new big guns and you've been surfing some big waves, which is your new um, sponsor, Patagonia down um, around the Great Ocean Road area, down deep down south there? Uh, well, Victoria. I think I'll get in trouble if I say anything about that. I'm not going to say where it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, like again, see, the thing is, George did an 8.8 eight 
uh, edge board, yeah. single fin edge board, and um, and uh, and I rode it uh, in some solid waves down the bottom of Australia, yeah. and um, and again he threw me under the bus, and I came home completely wrecked from trying to ride really? this thing. But there were a couple moments of gold in this design yeah. that then um, made me think in a new way about some guns and. Uh, and just playing around with basically big shortboards, you know, like just blowing up the shapes that we ride for little waves into bigger waves. And that's a totally common thing now anyway. Like you look at the crew in Jaws, you know, over in Maui, yeah. who are riding boards in the eight feet, short nine foot range. In like an seriously, Albert Yeah, in those, yeah. exactly, in big, big waves. Um, but they have, yeah, more curve in them. They're not so pinny and like that typical gun mm. shape, you know. Mm. Yeah. So that's been fun just to play around with that. You had a great relationship with Billabong. Um, you surfed for them for many years, modelled yeah. for them. Um, great relationship. And now you've um, moved on. You ride for Patagonia now. And um, due to um, wanting to help with their envi environmental program, right? Mm, yeah. How's that going? Yeah, amazing. Um, for, for me, you know, I, I, I really owe a lot to Billabong for looking after me for so long. I'm actually really surprised that that went as long as it did, mm. um, you know, I'm a bit long in the tooth these days, <laughs> got plenty of grey hairs to show it and, <laughs> and you know, um, just, I don't know, there's just great support there and um, working on ecological issues is always something that was important to me, um, just sort of coming from the family I came from and, um, and also just just due to doing different sort of trips where I'd be in places longer than you would if you're on a contest sort of schedule, you know, your two weeks or however long you got for a contest is what you've got and then you move on to the next place. And, you know, when I stopped doing contests, I really wanted to go to places where I could um, embed into the local culture and see what's going on there and yeah. feel what the local people are feeling and, and just see what's up and see if there's any way I could contribute, even though I was just a stupid surfer there's no real schooling or anything you know there could be ways I could help out um, and pretty soon I realized that the way I could help out would be to you know talk about a local issue but on a global scale you know so like help things like surf aid in Indo or help things um, relating to ocean um, pollution issues or specific animal issues like, um, yeah you do a lot of work with sea shepherd yeah and, and so all those things over the years were there and um and for a good six years there that's really all i did was back yeah. to back doing campaigns yeah. that i'd you come, come up with yeah, yeah i was with, with the sea shepherd crew in the galapagos islands yeah. working against um the anti-shark finning yeah. um crew there like really um really just joining people who were doing great stuff and seeing how we could bring the surfing world to those groups and that kind of work. Because I remember when I met Paul Watson in like 2005, and he's Captain Paul Watson of yep. the Started yep. Sea Shepherd, one of the founders legend. of Greenpeace as well. A yep. uh, legend, you know, when I met him and then started talking about him in the surfing world, nobody had any idea who he was and the work they were doing. Like no one had any idea what they were up to. They had one boat that was shredded from being rammed and, you know, bash so many times and mm. that was all they had going on and and then you know we started to help popularize that kind of work and that kind of protest and everything um, in the surfing world and then they started to gather their own steam through things like whale wars and animal mm. planet coming to help them out and stuff mm. and and all of a sudden you know talk about ecological issues started to become quite popular and especially in the surfing world and mm. and that was really exciting because you know here we are as surfers like for example we go to Indo most years especially Australians and you'll notice everywhere you go the amount of fish that used to be in those areas is now no longer there yeah you notice the amount of debris the marine debris in the ocean is exponentially larger than it used to be uh, and that's the same story all over the planet everywhere that we go and we go to these different places most years you get to see the change because you know you've been away for a year mm. and then you get back to that place and you notice oh hang on there wasn't a freaking huge high rise in an instant suburb there last year mm. where does all their shit go oh it goes into the sewage it pops out right there at the mm. top of the point you know at the river mouth you know and so everywhere all over the world these those sort of experiences were happening for me and and that just made me feel like oh i'd like to help um, where I can in some way with the skills I've got and uh, and then eventually it got to a point for me where 
I really just want to be doing that stuff. Yeah. You know, the surfing thing is great and everything. Free surfing is an incredibly ble blessed life. And, mm. you know, it's an incredible journey to have. Uh, really, really fortunate. But th there's not a lot of meaningfulness in that kind of life for me. It doesn't mm. feel very purposeful and meaningful. Yeah. You know, like, it's really fun going <laughs> and surfing with crew and partying and yeah. playing music and doing all these great fun Does it things feel together a little greedy or? but yeah totally selfish yeah, 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 yeah. i just feel like a totally selfish yeah. dingbat for the last few decades really and mm. so for me it feels really good to offset that with something some kind of work some kind of effort um, that's not geared towards myself it's for others and for the benefit of something else and so just got to a point you know in the last few years where i've really wanted to do that stuff more and uh and seeing the work that patagonia does you know yvonne chenard has set up the company in the most incredible way and uh you know their whole mission statement of um you know making the best product and having a low impact in the world and using business to make positive change and all these great things are, are really a foundation that i identify with and and it just feels good to be spending mm. my time on um, issues that I really care about. You know, mm. the last few days I've been writing about um, the anti-protest laws in, here in Australia and that, you know, if you go and try and blockade or protest something happening in your local area, all of a sudden police can just arrest you and Put throw you in, you in jail for four years and give you thousands and thousands of dollars fine. Um, you know, and all of these crazy new laws are coming in here to try and inhibit us from participating and you know, protecting our rivers or our hinterland or whatever it may be, um, you know, and my work with Patagonia has just seen me like literally writing about my protest experiences um, and being in support of Bob Brown, who's challenging those new laws right now. Uh, and that's what I'm doing. You know, I'm going surfing and doing surfing stuff with the crew at Patagonia, but but largely it's, it's about that kind of work. Mm, that's so cool. And that's just... That's just the shit. I just love it. I just feel super grateful <laughs> so and cool. stoked that I can spend my time on that. Mm. Uh, and that's, you know, a bit of a season in life, you know. I'm in my 30s now and, mm. and just sort of, yeah, wanting to do that kind of stuff. That's so cool. Yeah. Had a, had a really good ride so far. So, so good. The planet loves you. The planet must <laughs> well, love you. <laughs> mate, I still drive the stinkiest car too. <laughs> no, no, My car right. stinks like shit. You know, I, I have power that comes from the local power grid. Oh, so you know, you're not actually yeah. off-grid? Yeah. No, we've got, well, part of our place is off-grid. Yeah. And, I've, yeah. you know, Lauren and I lived like that for three or four yeah. years. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we still, yeah, make a mess just like everyone else. Yeah. You know, we fill our bins, bins up every week with rubbish and... Um, I'm not pretending to have any kind of act that's in any way better than anyone else's, but but doing, doing that really kind good. of work feels, feels yeah. really good. You're not going to go as extreme meaningful. and be on one of those shows naked and afraid for, <laughs> for 40 days. No one wants to see my hairy ass <laughs> being very naked and very afraid. Actually, my neighbours probably get to see that a few times, but yeah. I love that show. Not that far. <laughs> and so with that the movie that Jack McCoy made of you and Andy Blue Horizon, and he was pretty much in his peak at that time, wasn't he? And yeah. he was very focused on competition. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like scary focus, yeah. you know, but, but the, th the times that we had together weren't around any of that scene, no. you know, and we had a specific trip to Tahiti that was super special somewhere in the middle of the year, like August or something. Mm -hmm. There's no one around and we got to surf in town, Tarpuna and good Chopu together and, and, um, you know, all those layers like you were talking about before, how contests put all those layers on and yeah. the, that maybe that spirit feeling f yep. is sort of lost among all of mm -hmm. that. You know, then when we would do those little the, trips the, together, those all those layers were gone, were mm. off from him. Mm. And, you know, what he, he was just such a fizzer. It's he was just so like, good. just ah, <laughs> surf crazy. So, you know, I, I'm just super grateful that I had those moments with him to experience that. And, and that can be said with, you know, all the people like yourself and Joel and the crew that I've seen surfing over the years in person that have gone on and won world titles and been at the top of that level. Um, there's just magic there. Like, there's just magic there. And all mm. you guys, like, when you see that thing click, when someone goes into that, like, beast mode yeah. setup, it's just amazing. And you can see that, like, with John John in, in um, Margaret River and you know, those glimpses of that when that happens in the contests, it's just a good thing. If someone's wearing a, a colour on them and it's in 
30 minute intervals or whatever it doesn't really matter when you see that person click into that mm. that sort of magical space yeah where nothing you can see nothing else exists mm -hmm. you know it's really special and talking about tahiti you were there for the code red swell <laughs> you were you crazy man i was there my actually. goodness i i um saw the footage i i actually was there and i i had to go <laughs> i mean crazy. obviously i was never going to surf that swell but um i was there and i had to leave the day before and i just got to see that um that session yeah. um actually you were in the airport in new zealand i got to see a bit of it oh, but yeah. um you you got some crazy it was a crazy day. day that was um that was at the start of a project with taylor Steele. yeah because you followed that swell yeah didn't you? yeah, yeah. Uh, craig ando and and uh and myself uh were joining todd glazer and taylor Steele um to basically um you know follow a swell through the pacific and, and you followed and up to alaska swell. yeah we've been waiting a while for something like that to happen mm. and uh and then that blob just appeared you were and we're like oh it's the contest is on and that's <laughs> going to be weird but it's only there you know because then we're going to hop skip and jump mm. the rest of the places so um so we just said yep let's do it and we met in uh tahiti the night like we got in at midnight mm. and then tried to sleep i think we slept wow. like two hours mm. and we're up at like you know four in the morning just pacing and watching fridges float by and out <laughs> through the channel and just and craig had never been to tahiti so he was wow. like what is this place who are these people what are these waves it was just all did he go much. out that day yeah yeah so he i'm did. like i'm like come on we just go to paddle out just, the more we think about it the less you'll do it like just, just get aboard we won't even surf these boards. We just need yeah, to paddle, paddle out and, and be mm. in that space because there's nothing like this. You'll yeah. never see anything like that again. And so he was just like, all right. <laughs> so we jumped in the channel and we just suck straight out like so quickly from mummy and puppies there, straight out the channel, paddled over and got near the little, you know, moorings mm. that are normally way in the channel. And they were just getting pulled over the falls and stuff. Whoa. And we sat there and... Um, and uh, the first couple of tow crew came out and, you know, I've towed like once in my life. Wow. I think Louis Egan towed me into a wave at Stratty in like 98 right. or something. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and so we were just sitting there and sitting there and it was low tide and a bit west and it was all very evil. Sketchy. And, yeah. uh, and then all of a sudden all the teams sort of left. I think a bunch of people were getting hurt and mm. uh, Hippo was out there. Okay. And uh, I'd known him from Gromit days on yeah. the Goldie and... And he zoomed past me a couple of times and I was like trying to get eye contact yeah, the to whole get time. Like, please come on, please come on, let me get it. Like, yeah. you know, just flick me into one. Yeah. And then finally he kind of looked over and saw like my yeah, eyeballs was... like this, come please. <laughs> and he was like, hey, hey. And so he let me borrow his board, but my freaking feet, you know, I got like size 13 feet. Oh, I wouldn't fit into his straps. Weren't really that cozy in his straps. And, uh, and anyway, he got a vest thing on and we went out and, uh, there was one other team of, there was one other ski out there. Yeah. I think it was um, a Brazilian guy or Kalani Chapman maybe was out there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they got one wave and got blown up and that went straight into the lagoon. And it was just he and I sitting wow. out the back, Hippo and I. There was no one around. And wow. it was ju I got the last wave before Romana said, No stop. more, cut it. Like, mm. everyone, we have to stop because someone's going to die. Mm. And so we were just sitting out the back and... And I'd surf there heaps, but yeah. never at that scale. Yeah, like yeah. It was just yeah. next level. And, uh, and so just this next set that came was like, come on, let's just go. Don't yeah. want to think about it. And so he pulled me in and, and I got one. And um, You got that crazy wave. Got, you, like, you rode it just and rode it right to the end. Yeah, it was really bad. <laughs> the end of it was really it not a good really sign because the lip was, you. instead of it being like this, it was actually coming at me like a right. The it lips was. got this weird kink in it. And uh, and then the shock thing came up, and just as before it hit me, dive. I just launched just before it was yeah. going to hit me. And how was that wipe out? Quite funnily though, I got I went down, I got sucked over, yeah. and one did one cycle, then got sucked over again, and landed on the bottom on my feet in oh, like wow. a standing position, like like literally just like, plop, like that. planted on my feet. So I went to a squat and just pushed off the bottom, wow. and got spat out the back of the wave. And it all happened like in a second. And uh, I got spat out the back of the wave. And, and was there did, one behind? I, no, no, there wasn't one no, behind. No I did like four swimming strokes and I was in the channel next to everyone. <laughs> and, wow. and the first ski that's sitting there was um, Strider. 
Makua and uh, Kamale Alexander yeah. all on one ski, like piggybacked on each other like this. <laughs> and they're like, how the fuck did you get here? And they're like, whale boy, whale boy. Oh, they? The fucking whales, man, they just pulled you out. Of it. And they did some, they just said some hilariously stupid shit about just how bizarrely I got spat out the back and into the just channel. Just like Jonah riding the whale. Yeah, it was, it was <laughs> so weird. It was really, really weird. So I got really lucky and I, I tweaked my knee, did a little tear hey, Did you cut knee. your feet? No. Not to be, no, 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 nothing. Just your feet are pretty tough. Yeah. You, you yeah. don't wear shoes. So. I'm aspiring to get the greeno foot. He's <laughs> yeah, worn right. shoes in 74 years. So <laughs> I'm working on it, but it was just bizarre. It was a, and then uh, I remember sitting there throughout the day and then, you know, just escalated and escalated and, so yeah, Romana, Romana called it off for yeah, about an hour, or so, an hour or so. Then Dylan and Laurie came out, yeah. and then they ruled, and it was amazing. It was mm -hmm. one of those things, you know. Uh, hooking up with the Patagonia team has mm -hmm. been, um, you know, a real intentional idea to wind back travel and just stay more local and, yeah. you know, be around our area on the north coast and stuff. And um, but still, you know, this like every surfer, if something happens and there. someone says, "Hey, there's something happening." in this one part of the world or whatever, there's an opportunity there, then, then I'll say yes to it um, if it feels right. And so the last opportunity like that was with um, Taylor Steele again. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, we've had some great adventures over the years to you know, India and uh, you know, that huge one from Tahiti to Alaska yeah. and stuff. And, and so uh, this time he was putting together a, a film project called Proximity, which okay. is about pairing up different surfers together. Mm -hmm. So he got uh, Ando and uh, Rob Machado together in mm -hmm. Chile and Shane and Albie Leia together in Scotland wow. and Kelly and John John in the Pacific somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he got uh, Steph Gilmore and I together oh, um, cool. for the points in Mexico. Wow. And, uh, and that was the first time he's put a, a woman in any of his surfing Films. First time, yeah, first time. It's true. And he's wow. been around a while, you yeah, know? and uh, he's done a lot of films. And so his missus is super stoked that there's a lady in one of his okay. projects, you yeah. know. And so that's really cool. And also, you know, just no one better than Steph Gilmore. Yeah, my goodness, it's just unbelievable. So, um, and so we went to an area where there's some point breaks uh, that were, you know, suited to I guess our kind of surfing coming yeah. from this part of the world where yeah. there's plenty of right points. Um, and yeah, we just surfed and hung out, and uh, and like the, I think the film is sort of loosely around conversations that we have between sessions and stuff, you know. So it's like, you know, uh, some pretty classic stuff of Kelly and John John talking about how it feels to compete and what that whole world's like, and and Steph and I, I think, we're just rapping out about you know surfing and style and surfing. Where does style come from and what feels good, you know, what's good surfing and uh, those sort of conversations are really neat to have and hear from a, a feminine perspective on on uh, good surfing, you know, how she defines that and... Uh, how was she surfing? And Yeah, crazy, <laughs> just amazing, like really hypnotic actually, mm. which is really interesting. She's doing, you know, this more spacious surfing than you'd see on um, tour and yeah. contests and stuff because, mm. you know, there's, and also because there's a long point break, it's mm. sort of like you need to sort of have a rhythm to that, yeah. you know, when it's a really long wave. So it was amazing to get to, to surf with, you know, really uh, Steph at the height of her powers, you, mm. know, you know, in her late 20s and uh, just like getting an insight into, yeah, someone who's really at the, the top of their game mm. yep. and just so humble and just she's, chilled she's, and uh, just a legend. Yeah. And, uh, and so it was really fun. We got to do some cool tandem waves together, oh, which yeah. was really neat. So that was uh, a good time, and uh, I think I got the best surf mat wave of my life. I haven't Did seen it? the film. I don't know if he puts it in it, but <laughs> I pray he does because <laughs> I got like I got the longest, fastest surf mat wow. wave of my life. Um, pulled out all these signature moves like the forklift and all these <laughs> other weird ones that you do on a mat, which is just you mm -hmm. know basically glorified ball dragging, but. <laughs> Uh, it was really fun. It was a really good trip. Great trip. Yeah. I can't wait to see it's that good. proximity. Yeah, proximity. It's sweet. So, yeah. And it's always, you know, it's just a weird experience, you know, doing those sort of movies where you just go surfing and you have a good time with your friends. And then a year later, it's all wrapped up in this little mm. package and, and uh, you get to see, relive those moments in a, you know, in an amazing way. They're like glorified 
home videos or something, you know, it's just a real uh, blessing to have those sort of experiences and those sort of times uh, catalogued in that way, you know, especially through someone's eyes like Taylor, you know, he's just a classic guy to do trips with. We just have the best time. So, mm. you know, those opportunities, I, I hope, keep coming and, you know, I'm sure I'll, if they do, I'll say yes to them because yeah. really, you know, a surfing, a surfing life is definitely one that's got some travel in it and, you know, seasons change and all of that. So, um, yeah, I, I really think that'll just keep happening. Mm, cool. be nice. Um, last question. What's your favourite surf destination? I'm picturing you, like, lately you've, I don't know if it was your last trip to Nias, but you scored it really big. And yeah. Some amazing photos. Yeah. Um, is it Nias? Or yeah, is that was Nias. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that, that I know was it was Nias, Nias but yeah. is it Nias? Oh, no, 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 definitely not. No. Yeah. Um, That's a gee whiz, you know. You've probably uh, got so many. Yeah. Um, uh, it's funny, you know, my favourite surf destinations, um, I, I could break it up into two categories. One would be like my nostalgic ones. Yeah. My favorite places that are no longer my favorite places because yeah, I probably nice. helped contribute to them being blown out and overpopulated and crowded and everything, <laughs> which is a kind of shit feeling. <laughs> oh, no. But but anyway, it's the truth. And uh, that would have to be, um, man, in the, the Mentawis. Yeah. yeah, the Mentawis, uh, early days on the Mangalui in the early 2000s. Um, there were so many waves that really didn't have names um, that I would jump on that boat for like a month at a time. And I've been and on that boat. That boat's so fun. Just, just amazing stuff with Matt there, yeah. such a legend. And and so there's a lot of those where we surf places and you know just no names and yeah. no photos that showed anything other than the waves, so that you know hopefully it would remain quiet. Yeah. Um, those are pretty special. But, you know, like also there's, the, the, for me, a hugely um, impactful time in my surfing life was in the late 90s surfing ship stands before, before wow. the crowds got mm. there um, with Andy Campbell in the late 90s I got, wow. and Margo a couple of times. But I got a sister in Tasmania that I'd always go visit and okay. I still do. Um, but we were getting to surf um, shippies there for a few years before anyone else was there and just I actually think I still have a board buried in the bush do you really yeah I used to bury oh, wow. a 7-2 Dennis Pang in the bush there <laughs> and leave it there I think I've got some canned baked beans and some other shitty food that's buried <laughs> with it in the bush there oh, wow. but I haven't been back down there in 17 years 17 years yeah I never went back after all the jet skis and everything yeah, went there right. um, so one of those, one of these days, I'll get back down there. But that was amazing for me because I felt like I was getting a glimpse into the seventies, the sixties and seventies, where people like Banksy and all those crew would go to deserts and there'd be no one there, or that people would get to ride these, you know, now infamous waves, you know, totally just revered waves, but with no one around. They'd have yeah. to figure out how to ride them and when they would be at their best and all of the boards you'd need for it. And so the first few years of surfing in, um, at Shippies there, it was the same. You know, we were riding seven sixes and stuff and trying to wrangle them over the step was not a good idea. So we <laughs> slowly learnt to shrink those things down and, and sleep there overnight and have fires on the rocks, but the rocks explode. So you can't have a fire too close on the rocks, but then you don't want to be under the cliff because things fall. And there's all these little trippy things. And there's a cave around the back that does all these blowhole things that'll wig out your equilibrium and all these fun things and figuring out that wave um, was just like a timeless experience for me that yeah. is amazing. It was just amazing. And it was, you know, uh, just a moment in time. I can't believe that ship search would be one of your favorite destinations to go. I've never surfed there, but that would be my least. <laughs> least. <laughs> well, me, mine too now. That's why I was meaning like nostalgic. That's yeah, why it, was, okay. it was a moment in time for me that was so special, but is no longer available. Yeah. Uh, and so, but you it's know. it's just such a scary look. Yeah, it's just a phenomena, you yeah. know. Uh, and nowadays it's really anywhere where the local people are happy, the water's clean yeah. and there's some good waves. Yeah. Um, and that's that's just great, you know. And and like I went to Sri Lanka the, for the first time last year, and that was great. We got to meet some amazing local people. Are super happy. There's national parks. There's elephants on the beach. There's you know wildlife everywhere. And you know that's my idea of 
a dream sort of experience or, or even just here going down mm. the back of our place and surfing alone and mm. um, you know that's just as meaningful for me and um, yeah I guess it's it's slides through your life like you have mm. different standards and you know what stoked you out as an 18 year old doesn't really stoke you out now and mm -hmm. it changes all the time so I'm kind of just happy if I'm in a place where people are happy and the water's clean in any kind of wave. Unreal. Mm. Well, thanks so much for being on the Upcast. Thank keep you, up, man. Keep up your such incredible work. I will appreciate it, Oc. Thanks yeah, for having um, me, you man. Make, you're making such an impact on the planet and I take my head off to you. And Thanks for being on the Upcast, yeah, Rasta. Mate. Oh, pleasure. Thank you. That's another Upcast, guys. Oh, God, there's too many jellyfish. It's such a wonderful life. It's such a wonderful life.